The Liberation of Sundrian City by Andrew Lewis Chapter 5 Control What is that song? Evander's hand paused and so too did the music. He turned his head only slightly toward Linus, who was standing in the entrance of the room. My apologies. Do you wish to sleep? He made to put the loot away, but was halted. No, don't stop. It's nice. I want to hear the song. Very well. Evander was the family's servant, and despite the daily mistreating from Henry Smith, he had been a loyal servant for seventeen long years. Although he was never a particularly cheery person, his demeanour usually quite whimsical and withdrawn, he seemed unusually gloomy tonight, slunk low in his bed in a dark corner of the room, which was only lit by the teetering flame of a single candle by the entrance. Linus crossed to his own bed and flopped heavily onto it. The lute began to exude a soft, uneven melody of notes. A countermelody started on the bass strings and resonated through the otherwise silent room. The rhythm steadied and the plucking became more deliberate. It was a soft, sad tune, slow and sweet, like sorrow manifesting its sound. Then Evander began to sing, as slowly and sweetly as his accompaniment. My sparely father, how far we would search, a sparrow or flutter, though not of this earth. There was longing in Evander's voice. Linus's mind cast downward into rest and ill-defined sorrow. We search for we must and will do forever, one plane, two skies, two birds, one feather. The lute played the melody of the lament once more, slow and relaxed. When the melody ended, the bass strings continued to run the lower rhythm for a full minute, a sort of meditation. Linus sunk deeper into his bed and the music hummed gently on until his eyes began to close. When it ended, the last note rang out for a long, extended moment, resonating warmly around the room. Another minute passed before anybody spoke. It was Evander who broke the silence. Did you speak to your mother on the way in? Yes. And did she tell you what your father did? She had not. Without turning away from her bubbling pot, she had merely said, Straight to your room, Linus. I'll call to you for dinner. Which was not an unusual greeting from Ava Smith. And being that he'd intended to do exactly that anyhow, he didn't argue. Linus turned to Evander to ask what his father had done, but as he did so, he saw for himself. Down the left side of Evander's face was a deep gash. It ran from his forehead down to the outer edge of his cheek, jumping the eye socket. There was silence while the two reflected, wondering, wondering what to say. Linus ran through a mental catalogue of the bruises and scratches he had seen on Evander, his mother, Ava, and himself over the years. The imagery was vivid in his mind. He'd run through this mental catalogue a thousand times. But of all the affliction he'd bared seeing, this must have been the worst. It looked as if Henry had used a knife for this effort. There was no reason for it. I made a simple mistake in the factory, and it was enough to set Henry off. He lost control. Amanda shook his head mournfully as he recalled the incident. Linus, I want you to promise me, if he takes a blade out to you, you will run. I, Linus paused. The thought of his father brandishing a blade at him was utterly terrifying. Promise me, Linus. I promise I would run. Of course I would run. Another five minutes passed before Evander spoke again, answering a question Linus had forgotten he'd asked. That song is a dirge. A hymn of mourning, said Evander, his voice coarse. The music I wrote, but the words are very old. Linus thought for a moment before responding, and then simply said, I liked it. Evander chuckled a little, though he kept his grim demeanour as he did, and said, Funny, isn't it, how something so dark can hold a certain allure? I think within us all we have a certain... He paused, carefully selecting his words. Curiosity toward the darkness of death. It lures us to indulge in the morbid. But there are better ways to explore the darkness of death than through violence. I explore it through my music. 
and at that his hand started to pluck the bass strings again, in that same soft meditative fashion as before. Linus fell asleep long before the strings of Evander's lute stopped buzzing, and slept right through the evening to the smell of dinner wafting in from the kitchen. In the weeks that followed, Linus worked harder than ever. But try as he did, he found that his every effort only disappointed his father. And although the incident with the blade and Evander had not been so much as mentioned since it had occurred, beatings were now an almost daily occurrence for Linus. His father grew more frustrated by the day. Your father has worked hard to keep his family in the Emperor's special residencies, Evander explained to Linus while they were carting crates of coal from the market. The gash on his face had healed somewhat and was now a rugged deep red scar. There was a gap in his left eyebrow where the hair would probably never grow back. It was a shame really, for before the gash Evander's face had been soft and symmetrical, with slightly feminine features, though housed in a tussled mane of dark hair. He is under immense pressure. If his arrowheads become substandard, the Emperor won't hesitate to expel us from our privileged home. Linus knew this. He understood it all too well. The special residencies were the most beautiful houses in the city, with the finest amenities, with the exception, of course, of the palace. But this luxury came at an immense cost. The men and women who populated the Emperor's special residencies were a people overrun with stress, battling hard in an effort to stay in their homes. The privilege of being granted a home in the special residencies was a fickle one, and it was the very root of of the overbearing pressure that Linus's father pushed on him. One day the Smith family arrow-making business would fall into Linus's hands and he would inherit this responsibility all by himself. Henry Smith was determined to have his son be properly prepared on that day so as to continue the proud tradition of the Smith family name. Although Evander meant to help, his words only made Linus feel worse. Linus and Evander arrived home from the market to find Henry standing at the front door, quarrelling bitterly with their neighbour, Butch Ormine, who forged armour for the palace guards. For decades there had been an annual competition between the families, in which a smith's family at broad arrow head was pitted against an Ormine's family body armour suit. If the arrow could pierce through the armour, the smiths were deemed triumphant, and Butch would endure a yet another year of Henry's smug comments and torment. It was true that the smith's arrows were extremely well crafted, the sharpest and strongest in the history of the city, with hardened steel heads fashioned for maximum penetration, well-balanced shafts for accuracy, and carefully selected goose feather fletching for true flight. It was also true that the Ormine's body armour was the finest in the city. But still, the competition was somewhat unfair. In order for the Ormines to sell their armour to the palace, they had to comply with strict regulations regarding the weight of the body armour. However, there were no regulations at all regarding the arrows. Not this year, Henry. We've got a little something extra. I hope you've made some modifications to your arrows, Smith, or you'll wish you had come testing day. Henry thought hard for a moment and then said, Well, we altered the cut of our feathers slightly, added a half inch to the length, better pitch in your stability, and we... He halted abruptly, realising he he was being mocked by Butch as he spoke, who was flapping a hand in front of his mouth sarcastically. Henry continued in a dark, brooding voice. Our arrows have been piercing your armour for twenty years. That's not about to change. Our arrows are sharp enough to pass through a human body, in one end and straight out the other. Or have you forgotten our reputation? I could remind you if you like. Ha! I think I'm happy to wait until next week, if it's all the same. Besides, I've seen you with a bow. I doubt you could hit me from there, said Butch, chortling loudly. Linus had to stifle a smile. Butch had a way of getting under Henry's skin. Maybe not, but a vander here could put an arrow through your eye from the other end of town, replied Henry, sounding quite serious about the matter. But Butch broke the seriousness with another deep chuckle and said, Well, why would Evander want to do that? I've got no qualms with him. Nor you, Linus. Two good men you've got there, Smith. It will be a good day when they take over from you completely. Before Henry could reply, Butch had turned and headed into his home, and as he did so he yelled over his shoulder. Bye for now, 
Henry, I've got lunch to be had. Henry stood fuming for a moment and then rounded on Linus and Evander. Get in here, he bellowed. Although it was quite entertaining, Linus hated it when his father talked with Butch. It always seemed to end in his father being exceedingly hot-headed for the remainder of the day. And as they approached the front door and Henry slapped Linus about the back of the head in an effort to hurry him through, it was abundantly apparent that it was indeed going to be another bad day as far as Henry Smith's temper was concerned. For Linus, the remainder of the week was spent labouring strenuously under the thundering commands of Henry, who was becoming more and more enraged as the test day drew nearer. He was utterly incensed by the challenge of piercing the Ormine's armour, working harder than Evander and Linus combined, and still managing to find time to vent colossal explosions of rage upon them. His mother, who was a hardened woman and well-practised in the art of tough love, was flustered too, scurrying about the house, worrying aloud whether dinner would be up to scratch, and snapping at Linus if he came anywhere near the kitchen. She was by no means beyond the wrath of Henry Smith, and strived to be helpful in whatever way she could. Midweek, she deemed it necessary to administer haircuts to both Henry and Linus, cropping their hair down to the usual short as possible length. You are representing our family, she nagged, and I will not have you doing so, looking like you've been dragged behind a cart. Evander's hair, much to the envy of Linus, was somehow beyond the reach of Ava Smith, and remained long and tasseled. On rest day, Linus had to work as fast as he could to complete his chores in time to see the elephants at the rest day executions, and as he walked home he wondered whether he would have been better off spending the afternoon sleeping. He was exhausted, and when he stumbled into his room and flopped down onto the bed, Evander snorted once from his own bed and rolled around to squint at him. Linus, he said groggily. He sniffed loudly and cleared his throat. Good show? Not bad. Got there a bit late. Just caught the end of Remy's speech. Apparently, he spent a full week tracking a band of fawns who were trying to hatch a dragon egg. He rounded up seven hungry chick trice and released them into their camp. He had to flee before he found out if they got to the egg or not, though. But he says he will check up on his next ep- expedition. Is that right? said Vander, rather absentmindedly. And there were four trials this time. Pretty good ones, too. It was that dopey old elephant, you know, the one with the snapped tusk. But the rider was quite good, and Linus paused, remembering that Evander wasn't all that interested in public executions. Sounds fun, said Evander, with a polite smile and a nod. Yeah, said Linus. And as he did, he noticed that on the floor beside Evander's bed was a single arrow. What's with the arrow, he asked. For it was unlike Evander to bring an arrow into their bedroom. It's for the test tomorrow. Spent all afternoon choosing that one. Your father made me compare every arrow in the stock, and that's the finest of them, said Evander. Ha! The man's obsessed, said Linus, in disbelief, at the measures his father had gone to. That's completely mad. Well, Evander shrugged. You never know, all mine seems pretty sure of himself. Yeah, but surely... Linus paused, and his face blanched with terror at the thought of failing tomorrow's test. His father would probably kill him. I'm sure it'll be fine, said Evander, bracingly. Twenty years straight, right? Nothing to worry about. Now, do you mind if I get a little more sleep, Linus? You might do well to get some rest too, you know. And with that, Linus puffed out a candle, and both darkness and quiet fell upon them. They slept solid, waking only to eat dinner when Ava Smith called to them, though Linus was quite sure Evander was asleep even whilst eating. Quite early in the morning, Henry, Evander and Linus made their way to the flax crop at the far end of the city, near the enormous wall that marked the limit of Sundrian City, to find Butch Ormine and his assistant waiting for them with their armour set up on a stand in the middle of the field. Sixty yards, just at there at the mark, measured it myself, said Butch as they approached. And don't worry, I haven't cheated, he added, spotting the suspicious look on Henry's face. Right. Then let's get this over with, said Henry, deciding to trust Butch on the matter. Evander began to ready the equipment, and as he did, Butch stood looking rather smug. True, he had been smug each of the last twenty years, only to eat his own proverbial hat, but it never stopped him taunting Henry all the same. 
Linus rather supposed that he just enjoyed the chance to bother Henry to the point of madness. Funny, perhaps, from an outsider's perspective. Evander stepped forth and approached the mark, giving a little nod to Henry. Henry did not return the gesture, but merely stood steely and glared. Shall I shoot now? Evander asked, somewhat tentatively. Yes, for heaven's sake, barked Henry. Take your time, tittered Butch happily. He notched the arrow and drew it back slowly. The crops bustled in the breeze, and Evander stood for a moment, with his eyes closed, feeling its direction. No one dared make a noise while he concentrated. Even Henry allowed him time to focus. He opened his eyes and drew the arrow back a little further, puffed his chest full of air and released the arrow. For Linus, the arrow seemed to move in slow motion, rolling perfectly through the air. Ha! Look at that! Straight through, I knew it! exploded Henry, suddenly light-hearted. I just knew it! Linus let out a whoop of relief, and Evander turned around, smiling. Shall we take a closer look? Butch asked, slightly deflated. I still want to see the damage up close. Well, it's not half as bad as last year, said Butch, examining the armour closely. Another year and I think we'll have you. Bah, do your worst, Butch, Henry replied. Linus couldn't help but notice that the damage was indeed noticeably less than the previous years. The arrow had barely pierced the front of the armour, whereas last year it had gone straight through the front plate and well into the black back plate, with the arrowhead embedded halfway out the other end. For a short while, Linus thought that his father hadn't noticed this, but as they made their way home, it became apparent that he had indeed noticed, for he rounded on Linus and Evander once more. Useless, absolutely useless, the pair of you. Barely made it through, he griped, his short-lived light-heartedness now a distant memory. Don't know what you're so happy about, Evander, he snapped. Was that supposed to be a heart shot? Of course, as always, replied Evander who hadn't been showing any particular signs of happiness. Closer to the sternum, that was. Useless. And you, Linus. He paused, considering his only child, but didn't finish the sentence. Instead, he shook his head and groaned in utter disappointment. Linus went to bed that night with a bruised cheek and an aching eye. He couldn't remember ever being beaten this badly. <laughs>